As Party said, my name is Yoshi Kono. It's OK volume. Uh, and I'm presenting Ethical Frameworks and Computer Security Trolley, trolley Problems. This is joint work with Yasemin Ajar uh, and Wolf Lowe. Ethics and moral philosophy is a field that has existed for centuries. Computer security is computing in the presence of adversaries. Now, ethical and moral questions can arise throughout computer security research. For example, when deciding whether or not to pursue a project, when deciding on what paths for a project to, to take, or the path for disclosing vulnerabilities to the impacted stakeholders and the public, and much, much more. Our work is a cross-disciplinary collaboration where ethics and moral philosophy is represented by the co-author Wolf Lowe, and Yasemin and I represent computer security. Now, I firmly believe that much of computer security research field cares deeply about ethics and morality. For example, conference calls for papers discuss ethics, program committees have established ethics review subcommittees, and authors are discussing, discussing ethics in their submissions and in their publications. And there also exist guidelines and resources, such as the Minla report and other materials that we reference in our paper. And as a result, the field is often, though not always, making good ethical decisions. But a question arises, how do we define what constitutes a good ethical decision, and what should we do if there's disagreement on what constitutes good? To explore the potential for disagreement on what constitutes good, I'm going to describe several ethical scenarios. And these are scenarios that we developed over the course of our paper and are included in, uh, in the paper. I'll present two scenarios uh, and more. I'll present two scenarios. The first scenario, scenario A, imagine that you're a computer security researcher in the following situation. You are studying the computer security properties of a wireless implantable medical device a device that is known to extend the lives of patients by at least 10 years. And you find a vulnerability that, if exploited, could cause significant harm. The question is, what would you do in this situation? And I want you to think about this carefully, because there will be an opportunity to discuss. Now, what if I told you that the company that made the medical device no longer exists? It went bankrupt, and it is impossible to patch the vulnerability. But many patients have the device in their bodies, and the device is still being implanted in new patients. And for our scenario, let's say that I've told you you only have two options. You can disclose a vulnerability to everyone or to no one at all. What do you do? To make the analysis simpler and to let us focus on the ethical traditions instead of computations of probabilities, for the purposes of this presentation, let's assume that, the like, that you know that the likelihood of an adversary exploiting the vulnerability is extremely low. In fact, let's say zero, regardless of whether or how you disclose the vulnerability. In the paper, we discuss what to do in a non-zero situation. If you choose to not disclose the vulnerability, patients will have no awareness that their device is vulnerable, and patients will keep and or proceed with obtaining the device and receive significant health benefits. If you disclose the vulnerability, then patients now have a choice on whether or not to receive the device, but there is a risk of psychological harm if patients know they have a vulnerable device, even if the chance of exploitation is zero. And there's also a risk to health harm if patients choose not to receive or to remove the device. Now, stepping back in the scenario I just described, both options have undesirable aspects. And in fact, different people will, for very good reasons, make different decisions. When considering challenging ethical situations such as this, I believe that it is helpful to hear other people's perspectives and also to articulate my own perspective. And therefore, for only 30 seconds, uh, I would like you to find someone near you. I can't tell how crowded it is. Maybe turn to the row in front of you or behind you. And share, share your thoughts on what decision you think the researchers should make or how they should go about making their decision. Again, only 30 seconds. And I want to stress that you're not expected to have the singular right answer. Different people will have different answers. And I also, there's no expectation that anyone in the room is already an ethics, expert on ethics. So I will pause for 30 seconds and please discuss. Okay, let's go ahead and come back together. 
Uh, this is a hard problem, so I don't think anyone will have solved it yet. Uh, but to the extent that I can actually see beyond the lights, raise your hand if your group was not in perfect agreement or did not initially agree, or maybe had a hard time thinking about what to do. Exactly. Uh, I can't see, but I'm assuming there's hands raised. Okay. In some cases, there is not consensus on what is morally right or acceptable. And when this arises, having tools to reason through ethical decisions can help. And our work is intended to be in this broader space. Now, for our purposes, I'm going to give one more scenario. And I want to give this other scenario to just give an example of the diversity of the types of issues that we might encounter in our community. So for scenario C, imagine that you're a program committee member and a, re and a research paper is submitted to a conference. And that paper details the discovery of an undisclosed vulnerability in the product from company C. The authors write in their paper that they will eventually disclose to company C, but the authors do not want to disclose to company C until after the paper has been officially accepted. You're on the program committee and you read the paper. What should you do? And I won't have, there won't be time to discuss, but what should you do? Now, what if I told you you are an employee of that company C? What do you do? And what if you read the paper and you realize that the vulnerability can lead to serious harms if compromised, and it will take your company a long time to patch the vulnerability, and you're worried that adversaries might independently discover and start using the vulnerability before the paper is accepted and before company C is notified? What do you do? Now, if you say, well, you know, we really have to protect our users, let me add the following condition. The program committee chairs required all program committee members to explicitly agree to maintain the confidentiality of submissions, and you promised to maintain that confidentiality. These situations like this are difficult to reason through, but fortunately there exists a field called ethics and moral philosophy. Our scenarios that I described were built on the tradition of trolley problems. A trolley, and you'll see the kind of similarity in structure uh, in a moment. Some of you may already be familiar with trolley problems, some of you may not. But imagine a situation where a trolley is heading, a trolley with no brakes is heading straight along a set of tracks. Five people are tied to those tracks. One person is tied to an alternate set. A track operator observes this situation. The question is, what should the track operator do? Should they do nothing, which would result in the death of five people, or should they change the path of the trolley, resulting in the death of only one person? Philosophers use different approaches and different frameworks to reason about how to approach the situation. Consequentialist and deontological ethics are two of today's leading approaches. And in fact, consequentialist and deontological ethics are already appear in some form or another, even if not explicitly, throughout the computer security research field. And so the, for the purposes of this talk uh, and our work, we focus on consequentialist and deontological ethics. So I want to stress that these frameworks do have limitations. For example, they center Western approaches for ethics. And we are not arguing for the strict adherence to either of these frameworks. And in fact, it is not uncommon for people, including modern ethicists, to include elements in multiple frameworks as they reason through decisions. Consequentialist ethics focuses on the consequences of actions. An example of consequentialism is utilitarianism, in which the consequences are measured with respect to well-being. For example, health or happiness. Consequentialists count numbers, and they weigh the benefits versus harms. So as an example, one death is better than five deaths, and so the morally correct action is to change the trolley's tracks. In deontological ethics, we center the fundamental rights that people have, and the fact that moral actors have a duty to respect those rights. Examples of rights are rights to privacy, right to self-agency, and the right to informed consent. One example of deontological ethics is Kantian deontological ethics, where, among other things, they would say one should not violate a single person's rights in order to accomplish another objective. As Kant would say, human beings should be, treat, should be treated as ends and never purely as means. For example, changing the trolley tracks would violate one person's right, the right to live, in order to accomplish the saving of five other lives. Changing the track would use that single person as a means 
not as an end. And under Kantian deontological ethics, the morally correct action is to not change the trolley's track. So now let me return to scenario A. There won't be time to also revisit scenario C or our other scenarios, and so for that, please see our paper. And just as a reminder, though I know we just discussed it, researchers found a vulnerability in a medical device that cannot be patched. What should they do? Under consequentialist ethics, we observe, that was stated in the, in the scenario, that the likelihood of an exploit is zero, regardless of what decision you make. But there's a harm to patients if you inform them of the vulnerability. For example, there's a harm to health if they remove the device or choose not to get it. And there's a harm to happiness if they have to live with the knowledge of having a device that has faults. So the morally correct, correct action is to not disclose the vulnerability. On the other hand, in deontological ethics, we observe that there is a duty to protect people's rights. People have the right to informed consent, for example, all the warnings you see on medical ads, and a right to self-agency, a right to make their own decisions about what happens to their bodies and what's best for them. And therefore, the morally correct action under the strict deontological analysis is to disclose the vulnerability. So there's, of course, a lot of things to discuss, and we have not solved the problem of ethics and morality and security research, but there's a few discussion points I want to leave people with. One is that different ethical frameworks can lead to different conclusions. Of course, different ethical frameworks can also lead to the same conclusion. Sometimes a framework can fail to reach a conclusion, but there is still value in these frameworks. These frameworks can provide tools for internal thought and internal reasoning and these frameworks can provide tools for discussion, especially when there's disagreement between people on what constitutes good or right. Sometimes, it's important to note that sometimes the morally correct action is not in the best interest of the decision maker. And so since I said different, act, different frameworks can reach different conclusions in some situations, it is important for the decision maker to not pick a decision that they want and then find a framework that justifies it. As you probably have started to see in our examples, the details of the scenario matter. Of course, the real world is significantly more complex than the scenarios I presented here or that are in our paper. The real world, for example, offers many more options. For example, you know, talking with the FDA first and so on. Also, the uncertainty in the computer security field, for example, the uncertainty of the probability of an adversary manifesting uh, can make it difficult to reason about ethics. And we encourage authors and program committees to draw explicitly from these ethical frameworks. I realize I'm short on time. I want to mention that there are more scenarios in our paper. I hope you can check those out. And with that, as a summary of our work, we formulated computer security themed trolley problems. We explored them using consequentialist and deontological ethics. And we tried to reflect upon the, this exploration and articulate recommendations for the security research community. And so with that, I'll close.